Okay, so can you all hear me okay? Good. Welcome, everybody. So this is the first um, of the Tech Talk series, a new annual event series uh, hosted uh, by the Building Science and Technology Sequence at GSAP. Um, and this year we would be focusing on the implications of technological challenges uh, related to materials, cities, and ethics. And I have the pleasure of introducing Timothy Bitley, um, who is the Teresa Hines Professor of Sustainable Communities in the Department of Urban and Environmental Planning at the School of Architecture at University of Virginia. Um, Tim's uh, work um, is really exquisite and he focuses on sustainable communities and urban strategies to increase livability, um, uh, nature integrated spaces while reducing ecological footprints of cities. Um, he directs the Biophilic Cities Project at uh, University of Virginia, and he leads projects on topics such as the value of nature in the time of uh, pandemic, as well as an inspiring uh, biannual Biophilic Cities Journal. Uh, please make sure to check it out. Um, Tim is also uh, the author and co-author of more than 15 books on green urbanism, biophilic and resilient cities. Tim, we're excited to have you with us today and to hear more about your work. Uh, thank you so much for um, uh, joining and sharing your work with us. Thanks, Lola. It's great to, to be with you. Hoping everybody can hear me. Yes. Look, sounds good? Okay. And you can see the screen. I uh, wish I could be there in person and, and um, when all this is over, pandemic is over and um, we're back to some kind of normalcy, I, I promise I will come. I, be, I would love to hang out uh, in person. So we um, promise in, to invite you. <laughs> invite me back, great. Um, so I'm gonna, in the time that I have, I think the plan is, is maybe for me to talk around 40 minutes uh, or so and then have some questions, questions and answers uh, at the end. So uh, my goal is really to introduce you to this idea of biophilic cities, and uh, in particular, uh, this global network of cities that we have going on right now. So biophilic cities is really, it is at once um, a sort of a set of practices, <clears throat> um, a, a global movement, we believe, um, and then also a network of cities and individuals and organizations that are, have also joined the network. So um, I'll start, you know, I am an urban planner and, and uh, as Lois says, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about sustainability and, and what it means uh, to be a sustainable and resilient city and, and cities today are facing huge challenges in uh, tr trying to ra rapidly reduce their uh, greenhouse gas emissions and adapt to climate change and so on. And we believe that that uh, will require cities to be denser and more compact. And we can talk about that. Um, often the objection to that is that th there won't be room for nature or that we won't as residents of cities have that connection to nature. And so you see the question mark cities and nature, but it's really take away that question mark. So we, we argue strongly that you, you can and must in fact have compactness and density and, and nature uh, as well. So the idea does uh, build on this concept of, of biophilia and uh, have to give a give credit to you know, Wilson, Ed Wilson at Harvard. He wasn't the, the first person to use the word biophilia, but he's really the one who's coined it in the way that we, we mean it today. This idea of uh, co-evolving uh, with the natural world and the notion that we are uh, health, healthiest and happiest, um, able to lead the most meaningful lives possible when we have nature all around us. Here's, by the way, one definition um, from Ed Wilson. And that means nature that isn't just in places where we go to visit um, once or twice a year on holiday. Our key premise is that it has to be nature all around us. And, um, and, and, and we have to be living in cities where cities and urban neighborhoods immerse us in the natural world. So in around 2012 or 2011, we started this thing called the Biophilic Cities Project at, at UVA. 
Uh, and we started actually as a research project. We had funding from the Summit Foundation, Washington DC based foundation and multiple years of funding. Um, they were very generous and it was largely about trying to understand the innovative ways that cities around the world were we're putting nature at the center of their design and planning. And then at the end of uh, this project, a couple of years of, of research, we brought representatives to Charlottesville, Virginia, where the University of Virginia is. And uh, we had four days of meetings. And at the la on the last day, we sort of all agreed we really needed to keep this uh, momentum going and to, to build on the esprit de corps. And, and so we kind of spontaneously started this uh, Biophilic Cities Network, which I'll tell you more about. I think most of you know the evidence has just been been building over the last few years, uh, especially, uh, and we could spend the whole time talking about this evidence coming from from medicine and public health and economics. Um, but I, I think it's for me a very intuitive thing when I think about what what are the things that I'm drawn to. What are the things that give me a joy and meaning, and they are the things in the natural world. They are flowers and butterflies and birds and trees and and places like the shoreline and um, and the the sounds of things like water. Um, and so these are things that mm, tend to make us tend to reduce our stress levels and tend to make us feel better. And and there is a lot of evidence, and you could argue that it's more. More, it's less causal and more uh, correlational, and that's certainly true. But it's it's building almost by week by week. So um, just a little little few little snippets of some of the evidence. Here's a bioscience uh, study uh, showing the relationship uh, between greener, uh, more natureful neighborhoods, uh, neighborhoods that are higher in in bird diversity and and, and trees. Um, those places tend to, to show lower levels of depression, anxiety, and, and stress. Um, there is a power, you know, the power of nature, the power of a walk in nature. Many of you know the, know about the forest bathing work out of Japan, that at the end of that walk through a forest, um, your uh, stress hormone levels go down, that that walk in that forest gives you a boost to your immune system. And the Japanese are so convinced that they've set up you know, a network of forest bathing stations around, around the country. Um, we don't you know, entirely understand why this is the case and, and what the dynamics are at work. Um, there is a science behind this. Um, here's a quote from Richard Taylor who chairs the physics department at the University of Oregon, who talks about this idea of fractal fluency. Fractals are uh, these self-repeating uh, shapes and forms in nature. So that, that leaf is a small version of the bow, which is a small version of the larger tree. Um, and, and pretty good evidence that, as Taylor argues, our visual systems have evolved to sort of effortless, effortlessly process uh, these, that fractal information that we see in nature. So not surprising that we are um, calmer, um, happier, uh, more relaxed in the presence of nature. The image on the left, by the way, um, is from a wonderful initiative in the UK where they're using bird song as a, as a way of detecting hearing loss. And it's really meant to remind me that there's a, a growing body of evidence about the power of bird song. Um, and that, you know, hospitals in the UK that are recording birdsong and then playing it back to the patients, uh, times when, for instance, a child is going into surgery or uh, stressful times when, when children are getting inoculated, for example. So, um, so we have this, this incredible power uh, that nature has. Um, and it's really difficult to array it, to, to, to summarize it. On, on, on one slide, you can't really do this. I tried to do, do it in this slide, but I was getting ready for a healthcare conference um, a couple of years ago and trying to um, create a summary slide and it's hard, but it is true that the things on the right uh, are all associated through research uh, and evidence with the presence of nature. So lower depression, I've already mentioned that, lower levels of stress, improved mood, uh, improved happiness, phys a greater physical activity, the greener the neighborhood, the more it propels us outside and we, and we get more exercise. Even 
things like crime and gun violence um, are shown to go down in, in green, greener uh, neighborhoods. Evidence coming out of psychology that we're more likely to be generous in the presence of nature, more likely to be um, you know, cooperative, more likely to think longer term. So it can be argued that uh, when we have nature around us, we are better human beings, uh, actually. If you had to summarize all of this, we, we find the word flourishing to be a really good one because it captures not only the, the, the pleasure and joy that you get from having nature around you, but also the, the meaning and the purpose that nature gives to, to our lives. So we want, we want flourishing communities and planet, planets, but we also you know, flourishing human beings as well. Um, just a, uh, Lola mentioned this work that we've started to do around the pandemic. And I, I know there are lots of folks, um, lots of colleagues in New York and elsewhere that have done a wonderful job tracking the way, ways in which people are reacting or responding to, 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 to the pandemic in real time and how we're managing lockdowns and all of that. And I think it's maybe an obvious thing to say now, but we, we have you know, appreciated nature in ways that maybe we didn't before. Nature has been a saving grace, a balm, a solve. It's, it's been that thing uh, that's kept us uh, steady and a, a lot of us anyway, I include myself in this. And so we are trying to understand uh, what cities are doing in real time in the pandemic to make it uh, easier um, for residents to enjoy that nature and to, to gain those benefits um, from nature. So these are two of our partner cities, Portland on the left, Edmonton, Canada on the right. On the left, that's uh, Forest Park in Portland, um, you know, kind of unprecedented demand to be in that park. And uh, the city did a, a wonderful thing of kind of creating these one-way uh, walking loops to maximize the number of people uh, who could enjoy that 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 park. So obviously parks have been very important, but as the, the map on the right shows, I think we're appreciating all of those, the spaces all around us, a, a backyard, a front yard, a, a corner lot, um, the spaces along, you know, those larger uh, features like rivers um, have, have become incredibly uh, important as places to to um, seek solace and quiet sometimes and, and um, to recharge from this otherwise sort of stressful time that we're in. So, so we're, we are learning a lot about, about nature during, during this pandemic. And uh, it is my hope actually that one of the things that will happen is that this renewed sense of importance that we we're giving to nature, we are recognizing about nature will we'll carry forward and it will carry forward in our lives after the pandemic. And it will also be a, a force uh, for positive uh, change in, in our cities and our cities will become hopefully more biophilic as a result of, of what, we're, what we've learned about ourselves. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about birds and I have a, a new book of the bird friendly city that's just been, just come out in November. I have a couple of slides about it, but but it is definitely true. Um, a, a lot of evidence that during the pandemic we've seen a rise in the numbers of people enjoying birds and engaging in bird in bird watching. Um, and it and evidence shown here that um, the greater the diversity, greater biological diversity generally, but but gr uh, the greater the diversity of of uh, bird species in a in a neighborhood or in a place, um, that that is a, a predictor of, of higher, greater happiness for human beings. So one of the things that's been really interesting to watch is how during the um, um, periods of lockdown in, in many cities, this, these are images from Singapore. Singapore is one of our partner cities from the beginning in our network. Um, they went through a, a very interesting Two month lockdown, um, and in which a lot of the usual kind of tending to the parks and the grass and the, <clears throat> the landscaping <clears throat> that they that they did and the National Parks Board typically did, they weren't able to do. And it's been really interesting to watch 
how that has led to <clears throat> a sense of maybe wanting the city to be wilder than it has been in the past. And as I say here, greater appreciation for the concept of wildness and this, um, this lockdown, people were noticing birds and, and butterflies and, and sort of uh, realizing that maybe it's not always the best thing to, to you know, cut the grass and you know, so frequently and that we, they've got to make room actually for biodiversity. And in fact, they have a history of doing that. And the two images on the right are from um, the wonderful story around the, um, the uh, reemergence of the smooth-coated otters in, uh, in Singapore. There are, I think, 80, uh, more than 80 now, and, and multiple families. This is me on the bottom. We, we um, <clears throat> made a short documentary film about the smooth-coated otters. And if I forget to say this, uh, please take a look at our website, um, biofluxcities.org, and there's a film page and I, there are a number of places here actually where I'm going to just quickly mention that there are short documentary films that you could watch uh, later to learn more uh, about these stories. So that's one of the things that we've really been spending a lot of time doing is trying to capture these stories, telling these stories in a, in a, in a visually persuasive uh, manner. And we're finding that the, the five to seven minute sort of short documentary film is a very effective way to do that. So a lot of these cities, a lot of our cities making room for, for wildness. Um, we have a lot of other reasons, of course, to incorporate nature into cities, lots of ecological services, lots of things that nature is doing for us in cities. This is an image from Rotterdam um, where they are very creatively using nature to address water, uh, to retain and control and manage water and um, um, you know, wonderful, uh, story uh, there. So it's everything from subsidizing green installation of green roofs to uh, installing um, things like the, the water square uh, and the water plaza as it's sometimes called and, and uh, the idea of creating new uh, green public spaces where they're needed in the city but also designing them to retain and store um, uh, water. And there are, of course, many compelling stories of the ecological services provided um, by natural systems. When you, we invest in those natural systems, they deliver that contact with nature that we need, but they also are doing wonderful other things for us. This is an image from uh, Bishan Park in Singapore, uh, which was a, um, a, a, essentially a concrete a flood channel. Um, wonderful restoration project. And here it is um, a few months ago, uh, full of rainwater, doing exactly what it was in, intended to, to do um, with the water, um, you know, kind of passing over the banks and being kind of retained and, 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 and preventing flooding in the developed parts of the, of the city. So, so when we speak about a biophilic city, what do we mean? And I've got a few slides to talk about that. Um, we've certainly seen a, a rise in, in biophilic design. And we say biophilic design, we're usually, we're often talking about the design of a, of a building. Um, and we have, you know, wonderful stories and wonderful examples of how we can make um, the places we work and live in much more natureful. And this is a, a, a story we've gotten to know Ty Farrow, um, a um, Toronto-based architect. This is his uh, essentially a cancer center uh, in Toronto, which has living trees you see in, in the lobby, but it's also has these engineered lam laminated um, wood beams that actually are in the form of a forest. And, and you feel as you walk into this place that you're, you're very much in a, in a forest. Um, so there's so many wonderful examples. Um, this is the Phipps Conservatory in, in Pittsburgh, um, a building Lola, I expect you know, um, the Center for Sustainable Landscapes. And it's a wonderful story of a biophilic building. You see the green rooftop, public green roof, uh, using lots of native plants. Every window, every workspace has a, an expansive view of the nature outside the landscapes and the nature around the structure, uh, but natural daylight, natural ventilation. It's uh, a wonderful building. 
Um, we have a brand new um, six or seven minute film about the Center for, about CSL, Center for Landscape, Center for Sustainable Landscapes, um, and uh, an interview with Richard Piacentini, who is the um, head of the, um, of the Fitz Conservatory. So another good one to, to watch. I have to give a lot of credit. There are lots of folks, you know, working in biophilic design, and I, I don't want to spend too much time talking about um, biophilic design elements and attributes. These are the, the this is a system actually, Stephen Kellert um, from Yale, who is one of the heroes in, in the area of biophilic design, one of the early uh, proponents of it. And uh, these are highlighting some of the features that make up a biophilic building. It's obviously living nature. It's it's um, water and air and natural ventilation plants, but also shapes and forms of nature. I mentioned fractals before, um, but in natural light, all kinds of light and space, um, place-based relationships. Uh, we want places you know, and buildings that are unique and different and uh, avoid the sameness uh, of, uh, that we see in so many places. Um, and awe. I'm going to maybe circle back around and talk about the idea of awe and, and wonder in a, in a city. And a biophilic city is one that maximizes, we would say, moments of awe, of possibilities of, of, of awe. Um, another new film on our webpage is, a, I think, a five or six minute film about the Frick Environmental Center, uh, another Pittsburgh building, uh, wonderful biophilic features with an emphasis on wood. Uh, wood is, a, you know, considered a, a, a really important biophilic feature uh, or material and, uh, and also sequesters carbon. Uh, really interesting story here. Um, both the CSL and the Frick Center are uh, living building certified uh, buildings. So they uh, are required to produce as much energy as they need. And so there's zero energy, net zero energy and net zero water. And the image on the right is a really interesting story of how um, this uh, portion of the building has been retrofitted to make it make the glass uh, bird friendly. So actually working with some high school students, um, they designed and installed um, these paracords. These are sort of parachute cords that, that um, drape down from the top of the window and basically allow birds to see uh, that glass and not strike it. And uh, so bird safe design is uh, uh, certainly a key element of biophilic design in biophilic uh, cities. Um, yet another short film, relatively new one on the webpage is the retrofitting of this, uh, uh, this building that's now become the headquarters for the inter Interface Carpet Company. It's known as the Interface Base Camp and it's really Interesting for a lot of the the, the interior elements, um, but the most dramatic feature is this uh, glass facade. These 300 plus panels of, of glass um, that, upon which, um, are is this sheath that creates the image of a sort of mid-Atlantic forest, and is really quite dramatic and um, um, again a biophilic uh, feature. Um, the idea of, of actually integrating spaces for nature into every, every new structure. This is a, a new building that's um, in Toronto, not been constructed yet, but um, we've gotten to know Brian Brisbane who's the architect there. And, and this is sort of a, a um, Bosco Verticale uh, ver version of a, a vertical forest. Um, improved a little bit, he would say, Brian would say, uh, incorporating into the into the floor plates of this building, growing growing space for these uh, trees and this sort of plug and play approach to uh, to trees, but several hundred trees actually in this vertical um, vertical forest essentially. Really interesting story um, that Brian Brisbane uh, has, uh, tells us that um, the proponents, um, the strongest proponents for this building uh, before the city. Um, when it was being considered going through the permitting pro process were the neighbors. And um, surrounding neighbors are, are often, there's often a, often a nimbyism that um, they object to buildings like this, but they actually came out strongly in favor of it, seeing the, the, the forest as a, 
as a sort of this almost a hill town, forested hill town that was going to add uh, um, natureful amenity to to their neighborhood rather than than detract uh, from it. So a really interesting uh, story there. So we certainly embrace biophilic design, and and every building uh, should be designed to be biophilic and natureful, but. And a, and a biophilic city is a city with lots of biophilic buildings, but obviously uh, it's more than that. So um, biophilic cities are cities that think about nature everywhere, right? And all those spaces beyond the buildings, between the buildings, from room or rooftop, uh, all the way to region or bioregion and all of the scales uh, in between. Um, you know, it's certainly buildings and parks, but it's all these other things mentioned uh, here and and an emphasis on on actively working to connect us to to nature. It's connecting us to nature, but also connecting us to each other uh, through nature. And it's also uh, our vision of biophilic cities also includes a strong conservation uh, element. We recognize that cities have to uh, help to address the global conservation challenge, the global loss of biodiversity. We know that cities harbor lots of biodiversity and we can actively design and plan uh, to accommodate more. We have to think about how uh, cities can share space with many other forms of life. And so we're frequently are, uh, um, arguing for coexistence and care. And so there's an ethical dimension to this as well, a kind of biocentrism to, the, to our vision of what a biophilic city is. So, um, just a little bit more about the vision. It, it is a, a place that immerses you in nature. It, it, Singapore, again, is probably our best example of this. They have uh, officially changed their motto from uh, Singapore, a garden city, to Singapore, a city and a garden, which is a sort of a powerful uh, change. But more recently, as I've mentioned, they've been going through this, this discussion about you know, how much tended you know, nature do they want? Maybe they want to be wilder. And so actually in parks and uh, proponents of, of the, the biophilic city's vision there are now frequently talking about Singapore's a city in nature. Um, and a, a bunch of policies, different things the city is doing to, to bring this about. This is the, the building you see here is an example of that at the Park Royal Hotel, it's Aloha. Woha is a, a Singapore-based design firm. They do wonderful work. Um, there is a requirement now that when you build a building like this, you have to at least replace the nature lost at ground level with uh, nature in the vertical realm. And this building does it uh, more than 200 uh, percent. And now there's sort of a friendly competition between um, developers and builders and architects to see to see you know how far, how much uh, nature in the vertical realm. Uh, you can provide. So here's another, just another image um, to show that idea of multi-scaled room or rooftop to region or bioregion. We sometimes talk about this as a whole of, of, of city uh, approach. Um, and, and that's something, again, that makes us a little bit different uh, as a vision and as a network. It's, it's about all the remnant nature, but it's also about all of the things constructed and all of the things designed and built and all those things, hopefully, uh, begin to lead to this vision of immersive nature. And by the way, um, just to go back to this for a second, the idea that you we're shifting from a city where we have some nature, some places, uh, and a and a park or um, street trees or some place you have to go to visit. That nature is somewhere you walk to. We want to reimagine the city as an ecosystem. It is an ecosystem, but we want to. You want to live in the park, in the garden, in the forest, um, um, not have to visit it. So, so we want this kind of e immersive uh, nature. It is uh, definitely a matrix of urban nature, um, and there, uh, you know, there's we're interested in indoor, all the way to outdoor, all those um, spaces and places in between. We want to work, continue to work on overcoming the barriers to in, from between indoor and, and outdoor. We want to move from a vision that just sees uh, discrete elements of nature to something that sees that city again as an ecosystem, and and those discrete features become um, connections and pathways 
this lower right is the ravine, a map of the ravine system in, in Toronto, for example. Um, Pittsburgh has been a partner city from uh, almost the beginning, and uh, they're doing some wonderful things. This is an image just to make the point that uh, nature is all around us in cities, and it and it may be that we find nature in places that we didn't expect, and that 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 bridge um, harbors a lot of nature. It may not be always obvious, but there may be a peregrine falcon nesting, and and you know the the nature that in Pittsburgh, a lot of it isn't water, and the idea that we bring more people down to the edge of that water, and we create designs like the South Shore Waterfront Park, a floodable water uh, floodable park but also uh, enhances that connection to nature they're quite proud of uh, the forest canopy cover which is 42 percent in, in, in pittsburgh um so we started this network again uh in officially in 2013 um there is a, a protocol for joining for cities to join uh, there are 24 cities now officially in the network as partner cities I'm going to run out of time to tell you more, but there's a lot more information on biophilicities.org, including the, the requirements for joining there. You have to sort of develop a narrative of, of uh, how your city is already biophilic, uh, what goals and aspirations you have for the future. We ask that you choose a certain number of indicators, certain metrics for judging uh, uh, progress over time. And then we ask that, that uh, we ask for a city council adopted proclamation or resolution. Usually I show up uh, to, this is Mayor Peduto, the mayor of uh, Pittsburgh, getting the certificate um, as they have enter the network. And there's usually a celebratory event. We did a big one at, at the Phipps Conservatory here. You also often get lots of good um, press, uh, just some evidence here. This is a, a map of where the network stands at this moment in time. You have a lot of cities that are queuing, we hope will be joining um, and uh, we, we have uh, hopes of, of expanding uh, in places like uh, Africa and, and uh, uh, we want Chinese cities, we want more Australian cities, um, we want more Indian cities. We have just one Indian city now in the network. Uh, so about half the cities are um, North American or, or European. Um, so just really quickly now, I'm, I think I'm going to just quickly transition, show you some slides and not tell you very much about any one slide. Um, this slide is really to make the point that there are so many different things um, that our cities are doing, so many different ways to give expression to this vision of a biophilic city. And, and it's from, you know, new programs for sidewalk gardens to, you know, reconnecting to rivers and water. Um, the marine realm is really important in many in many cities. And so just to quickly um, give you a few more seconds of that, a few examples um, in San Francisco, wonderful story. Here's Jane Martin, an architect actually, who had a lot to do with helping to create a special sidewalk landscape permit that lets uh, residents take up uh, hard surfaces and plant uh, plants and create these wonderful sidewalk gardens. And there are now more than 2,000 of these permits that have been issued. Vittoria Gestez, the capital of the Basque country in Spain, um, one, famous for its green ring that circles the city and this very compact, walkable, dense city. This is a, uh, a river daylighting or a stream daylighting project, a, a, a small river that was underground in a pipe bringing it back to the surface and bringing that nature into the core of this dense city and, and creating wonderful uh, um, public spaces as a result of that as well. Um, we're very much um, interested in cities becoming wilder, as I talked about, but uh, bringing more biodiversity in, into cities. And, and that can be done in really creative ways. This is a, a story from Perth in Western Australia. And we have a, a five or seven minute film about this one as well. This is a, a story of a very sterile, sterile energy intensive chlorinated um, water feature, typical sort of urban water feature converted to this wonderful, a beautiful native biodiverse wetland in the middle of the city that's become this um, place, this backdrop for lots of events and uh, a, really, a really different kind of um, green feature in this uh, city. Um, Richmond, Virginia, 
wonderful story of how the city is attempting to reconnect to its wild rivers, class four rapids, the James River, just a few hundred feet from, from downtown. Um, here's um, the, the undulating bridge that hangs from a, a highway that leads you, guides you out to um, Belle Isle, this beautiful wild island. Um, but Richmond, like a lot of cities, has a long history of uh, segregation and discrimination and, and, and uh, redlining. And, uh, and so not everybody has that connection to, and particularly neighbors, neighborhoods of color don't have that same connection to the water. So in their new plan, Richmond 300, um, they have incorporated some wonderful nature targets. I failed to mention Richmond is now in our network as well. Um, minimum tree canopy cover for all neighborhoods um, and steering those nature investments uh, to those neighborhoods that uh, need it the most um, and that are uh, the hottest and, and um, around, around a goal of, of, of racial justice and social equity. A, a really positive story um, that is moving forward pretty quickly in real time. So this is uh, LeVar Stoney, the mayor of Richmond, who has already created five new parks uh, on city owned property and underserved neighborhoods. It's a really wonderful story. So, so social equity, um, the idea of just biophilia is a key aspect of our vision of biophilic cities. And, um, we fair distribution of nature. We believe that nature is uh, a birthright and every and everybody is entitled to that beautiful uh, nature. So another story and another film um, is the story of Collie Park in Portland. Portland is one of our, um, our partner cities as well. This was a, a, a park in a, in a neighborhood that didn't have uh, a park of this size and a wonderful story of not, not simply planning a park from on high, but rather giving the neighborhood um, the ability to design and plan this park and express ownership of this park uh, over time and really wonderful story. These raised back gardens you see in on the lower left were actually designed uh, by kids in, in the neighborhood. So um, there are some metrics as I, I'm quickly running out of time. Um, I, I, I wanted to sort of make the point with this uh, slide that it's not just the presence or absence of nature that defines what a biophilic city is. It's a, a lot of other, potentially a lot of other things. How, how much uh, do residents care about that nature around them? How engaged are they? Are they able to identify common species of, of flora and fauna? Um, what about the institutions, the local government? How, how, how co committed are they to protecting, uh, restoring, connecting to that nature? And, and so, you know, what percentage of the budget goes to, to nature in a, in a city. And so we see some of our cities uh, doing lots of creative things, again, not just to increase the nature or to protect the nature, but rather to, to facilitate that contact, that connection, that caring about the natural world. So Reston, Virginia, uh, Newtown has been in our network um, and they recently uh, created this Reston Biophilic Pledge where they're actually challenging residents to do things to engage the nature in that, in that place, in that city. Um, we have a lot of stories about uh, how our cities are making room uh, for other forms of life. This is Edmonton, Canada, uh, has become a bit famous for its ecological network approach to planning. And it's um, constructed now, I think it's 27th wildlife passage, the idea of of designing and, and imagining a city so that it's a, a city that a, a coyote or, or, or birds can, can move through uh, and, and the city as, as habitat. I like that idea uh, a lot. Curie de Vaught, uh, is um, one of our member cities from Costa Rica and they have been engaged in a wonderful program they call Sweet City, which is about uh, planting pollinator plants uh, along sidewalks and parks and to bring more biodiversity into the center of the city. One of the really cool aspects of this though, you see it in the headline of this Guardian story, uh, is this idea that the mayor there who, who talks about uh, giving citizenship to bees, plants, and trees. What a wonderful um, uh, idea. 
uh, Vishakhapatnam, uh, our only Indian city so far, um, a, a wonderful story here of thinking more holistically about the other forms of life uh, that a biophilic city wants to nurture and accommodate. Here they have shoreline where olive ridley sea turtles come, come and nest. They also have a challenge of stray dogs. And so a wonderful story of the Humane Society there working to train the dogs to, to uh, actually protect the turtles. Um, anyway, a, a, a great story. So I mentioned this, this bird book and I'm coming to the end, I promise. Um, and if you're interested, this is the cover, Bird Friendly City. And a lot of stories about cities that are, that are making room for birds and doing lots of things from, from adopting minimum you know, bird safe design requirements to um, stories like the one on the left in, in London where this is a, a, a former industrial building where they've rebuilt the, this, this, um, this chimney essentially to incorporate swift uh, roosting um, uh, sites and uh, as a way of, of uh, partially compensating for the loss of, of uh, roosting sites, uh, nesting sites for the common swift. Uh, in, in the UK. Um, so we, we believe there's so many things that biophilic cities can do. We're trying to keep kind of trying to monitor the best practice. Here, here are examples from San Francisco, first American city to mandate uh, uh, installation of green roofs under their better roofs ordinance, first American city to have adopted uh, mandatory bird safe uh, building standards. Um, we have a, a special interest as well in how cities can begin to pay for uh, and fund and finance the investments in, in nature. Um, and cities like Washington DC is in our, our network, the first city to have used this really interesting tool of environmental impact bonds where investors actually get a higher return, the, the better the environmental performance. And so in the case of Washington, $25 million raised for investments in, in stormwater, uh, in natural stormwater uh, elements. Um, and increasingly cities like Austin, Austin, Texas has a wonderful uh, initiative where they're, they've set the goal of being carbon neutral. And so uh, carbon credits are, are being purchased um, and, and the planting of, of trees um, and moving that city slowly in the direction, but the, the um, idea of, of, of of funding the the, the uh, restoration of habitat, the, the planting of trees through through carbon through, through the purchase of carbon credits is one one technique many cities are engaged in. Okay, I, I really am coming to the end. Um, take a look at our webpage. We do lots of things on the network. Um, we share insights. The we have monthly partner city uh, calls. Wonderful spree de corps between the cities. Um, there is this biophilic cities uh, journal that Lola mentioned. Uh, all the issues uh, can be found online on biophilicsace.org, wonderful content. Um, and it's really been interesting to watch how the cities have been working together um, through city exchanges like this one, a group from Singapore coming to San Francisco to learn about it, bird friendly design standards. I mentioned the films and the filmmaking. Um, this is a sh the making of a, of a film, short film about Edmonton, Canada that's also on the webpage. Uh, we have a new film about Gotham Whale. You may know about that in New York City. Um, that's, I'm quite proud of that film. It's maybe seven or eight minutes, but a wonderful story. You all know the story of the, of the whales that have uh, returned to the waters of, of New York. And uh, we have also online a, a sort of crowdsourced global cities pattern book built on this idea of pattern language, Chris Alexander's idea and uh, we're sort of collecting these unique patterns from cities all over the world that you can add to. Then finally, we have, again, lots of resources if you're interested. We, uh, we've um, published a number of books about the, the cities in our network and, and the innovations there um, that they are uh, implementing. Um, also full-length uh, films like this one, The Nature of Cities, that was playing on PBS for a while. Our newest book about the Biofluid Cities Network is this Handbook of Biofluid City Planning and design, and it's just recently been uh, translated into Chinese. And that is it. I'm going to stop and we can have some discussion um, uh, and some question and answer. So do please uh, take a look at biophilicities.org. Um, I've been talking a lot about 
partner cities, but you can join the network as um, an individual and you just go online and you sign a pledge um, or as an organization. We have several have thousands of people now that have joined as individuals. It doesn't cost anything. And then once you join, we, you get all the you get all the emails and all the things that we're, we're doing. Webinars and conferences and, and whenever a new issue of Biofilic Cities uh, journal is, comes out, you hear about it. So Lola, I'll stop there. I'm sorry, that was a uh, little- and, and we should definitely have um, New York City registered as part of the Biophilic yeah. Network. You know, the, there are some, of course, uh, some really exciting Biophilic attributes in the city and also to make a commitment to a more Biophilic approach to building an urban um, yeah, development. That would be great. Um, this was wonderful, Tim, thank you so much. Um, I would like maybe to start with a, a kind of a, a expanding the conversation uh, and then having room for questions from uh, student participants. So your work really um, expands the notion of biophilic design that, you know, according to Keller and uh, previous uh, um, scholars of evolutionary biology perspective, we have a human physical and mental tendency or we need natural environments to be physically and mentally healthy. And you're expanding this to the most challenging context, to cities, to the urban dense core uh, that require you know, infrastructure, roads, systems, all that is not so much biophilic. And uh, I'm really curious to hear from you about uh, biophilic cities and infrastructure and materials mm -hmm. and energy. Because, you know, of course, biophilic mm -hmm. city planning increase uh, biodiversity and ecological values uh, and therefore promote, you know, social values. But what about the potential for materials um, um, and material connection with nature and urban infrastructure? Um, and I'm really interested, you know, mm -hmm. in natural and bio-based materials in urban systems. Mm. Uh, water, wood, bamboo, rammed earth that mimics sedimentary rock creation, yeah. fiber-based materials, recycled yeah. materials. How do they? Yeah. How can they come into account in in urban? Yeah. Context? Well, I think yeah, in in, in lots of ways. Um, and I mean, we mentioned just briefly, you know, that it's been really interesting, of course, to watch how uh, wood. Um, and you know tall timber and and that that trend and and um, I, I think it makes complete sense um, that we can find a way to to build new things that uh, are are beautiful connect us to nature biophilic but that also sequester carbon right or that, that um, and 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 many of the materials I think and many of the design strategies that we talk about are going to do multiple things for us. I think that's the the answer, right? That it's um, that we want to do. We want to create materials, use materials and design techniques um, that do that help to cool uh, buildings. And that we know, you know, the J Jacob Javits Center um, using bird bird safe um, glass, um, a huge step that they took. But it turns out it also reduces their energy consumption and their carbon emissions. So we can, you know, dramatic like 90 something percent reduction in bird mort mortality. But it's also something, you know, that makes sense from a carbon reduction and energy conservation point of view and almost everything that we advocate, whether it's uh, green roofs or, you know, urban tree planting, all those things that they do multiple things uh, for us. and. Uh, I'd love to know more. I'd love to explore more about the, you know, the the material innovations because I think that would be would be really interesting. And so we have a, you know, we have a lot of work uh, around the idea of, of um, habitature and you know rethinking building facades as as habitats for for birds and and insects and you know butterflies and all of that. And it seems like the more we uh, reimagine those, the, the building materials as, as something that, as things that are living, you know, that are, that are in, inherently natureful and biological, that, right. that, you know, we're better, we're better off. And 
I've been really intrigued in this bird book. I, you know, they, the idea of a, of a, you know, a, a building, a brick that's designed from the beginning to, to be a place for, you know, a swift. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, why don't we do more of that? Why don't we be kind of thinking about building, you know, building materials that, that, um, that, you know, are, are, that allow us to have all the, all this wonderful life around us. It's, really but it's a long, longer story, but I'd love your thoughts. And, you know, we need help mm -hmm. on that. Um, certainly. Right. And the relation to energy, of course, is, is, yeah. is critical here. And I would assume that there's a lot of evidence about the effect of, you know, biophilic design on perception of users. Yeah. So as to be more environmentally conscious as, as, yeah. as yeah. citizens of a city. So Yeah, def definitely. And all that evidence in the beginning that I showed about how in the in the presence of nature we are we are more likely to be generous human beings. I mean, this is experimental evidence, but um, it's also true that we are that there's a connection, there's an association um, between nature and and pro-social behaviors. That that the more we have nature around us, the more likely we are to care about that nature. We're more likely to be volunteering for that stream restoration or that tree planting or that um, uh, you know, leading a bird walk or something. So there's definitely a connection. If we want, if we want uh, eco deeply ecological citizens, um, investing in nature is a good way to start that. I think it's really exciting. Um, maybe we can open um, yeah. room for more for for students' questions. I I bet. Students would love to interact and ask questions. And if not, I have so many more questions. Sounds good. Um, <laughs> please, yeah, go ahead. If Rima, do you? Max, do you want to do you want to ask something? I was just turning my camera on to the start. Gotcha. I'll be thinking on that. Sure. Or anything Anyone? from the chat box. I can't, I haven't looked at the chat box, but. Anyone from the audience, this is a, this is a great opportunity to maybe <laughs> um, ask your question. Or, or react or comment. I'd love anything that sounds to you like it's crazy or not, you know. Um, well, how do you get to implement a change on such a big level as a city? Does it yeah. usually happen when you have many different parties interested in achieving something? Or oops, is it like a certain organization that pushes for it? Yeah. How does that usually happen? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And, and um, uh, when we think about, reflect on how cities get to our network and, and how they join the network, um, it is often the case that um, it, it takes a champion, you know, somebody often in local government who, who really sees this as important and then kind of rallies everybody around it. In some cases, there, there is a, there's an organization. Um, and we, we think actually, you know, one of the most effective ways for a city to, to embrace these ideas and to join our network and to, and to kind of advance the agenda is through a, a, a grassroots push. So in Washington, DC, for example, there was a group called Bio, um, Bio, uh, Biophilic DC, I was about to tell you about Biophilly, which is a, a group in Philadelphia. Um, but Biophilic DC then lobbied every city councilor, uh, everybody on the city council in, in Washington and educated them about this and, and advocated for, for the network and you know, embracing the concept of biophilia. And they got the resolution passed and it happened, it happened that way. There's always you know, work and, and pushing the, you know, pushing it forward and making sure things get implemented. Um, so it's it's a lot of grassroots, but it's also it, you know it can also be from the top down. I mean, having having a mayor you know who who embraces this idea um, can be really uh, important. From the perspective of answering your question from kind of more from a policy or you know what do, what do we need to do to to move a city quickly in the direction of this holistic vision of a natureful city. 
um, pilot projects and, and incremental steps are all good. And there are a thousand and one ways that you can start. If you can quickly ramp things up and, and bring, bring policies, you know, citywide policies, bring things to scale, that can make a, a huge difference. So I, I gave the example from San Francisco of, of you know, a mandatory green roof. I mean, they have a standard that lets you either, um, you have to have a green roof or a solar roof or a combination of green and, and solar um, and, and mandatory, you know, um, bird, bird safe design requirements. The, I'm a big fan of, of codes. We want flexibility. We want incentives. We want to, you know, um, we want to do things that um, that are co conscious of, of of the potential cost of that they have on 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 housing and, and and the price of housing, the price of construction. But we also want to quickly, you know, m move a city in, in that biophilic direction. I don't know if that answered your question at all, but uh, but it's so many you know different actors can play a role and so many different um, departments in a city can can uh, play a, an important part. So it's, you know, it's, and it's rethinking everything um, from the sort of standard infrastructural things to just everything about that city that, that. Well, would it vary a lot? Would it vary a lot if the city is in a developing country? Yeah, that's a really good uh, question. And um, I, I often get that, that sort of skeptical view that these are all wonderful things that you can do in cities like New York and, and London and Sydney, Australia, you know, in, in richer uh, northern cities for the most part. How is this going to work um, in other parts in the, you know, of the world um, and where you're having to deal with uh, high, a large percentage of the population living in informal settlements, for example, and dealing with kind of, you know, uh, levels of poverty, uh, maybe that. And I think it's a really important question. My, my answer is, uh, is, is usually that, you know, the, the ideas of, of, of connecting to nature, biophilic urbanism, biophilic cities are just as relevant in those places, if not more relevant and more important, actually, if you think about a, um, how to reimagine a, a, an informal settlement. Um, what are the things that would improve the quality of life in those places? And it's, it's, it's connections to nature, it's, it's planting trees and creating food uh, security where it didn't exist before and it's, um, treating and, 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 you know, producing fresh water. Um, nature does so many things that, um, that are, are needed and necessary and can, can really profoundly improve the quality of life anywhere. And so, um, every city will be different. This is true. You know, New York is not London and it's not Sydney and what can work will be different in each of those places and I don't think it's any any different maybe in the in the global south. Do you agree with that? Do you want to that make sense or we have a few examples, not as many as we as we we need um, of of success stories of wonderful kind of biophilic urban scale uh, initiatives and um, you know in other parts of the world. That's why we really need to expand our 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 network. Let's see, um, Amy, there's someone, Amy? No, I'm yes. looking around to see who. <laughs> I, have like a, I have a question. So okay. I, I'm, I'm if there's a thought about between the density of city and the applicability of the biophilic design and the city. Because hmm. when we imagine biophilia city, imagine a density and in density there's plants and there's diversity. But in a city, for example, like LA, that is not dense at all. Hmm. Amy, your video is, uh, your audio yeah. is 
is um, I didn't yeah I didn't catch all of that but um, I, this connection between density and and um, and biophilia <clears throat> I think is a really important one to think about um, <clears throat> you, we have lots of of uh, not very dense cities that are not very biophilic right and and it's often because they've committed so much of the landscape to cars and roadways and and gray you know hard surface kind of things so uh, <clears> the <throat> places where you might think there'd be more more opportunity to incorporate nature it isn't necessarily the case singapore i think is a really good example of of how you can have that that dense that density and also nature and they've done a really wonderful job it's not a perfect story um by any means but uh <clears throat> the, you know the the land sat sat um, imagery shows that, you know, over the last 15 years or something, they've uh, added a couple of million people um, to an already dense island. Um, and instead of going down, the, the, the green cover has actually gone up. So it is possible. And particularly when we reimagine in this post, in a post pandemic or pandemic and post pandemic period where we want fewer cars and more nature, more wildness. Uh, I, I think there will be opportunities everywhere to, to convert and everywhere to make, you know, there's, there's lots of room for nature. And, uh, and we just need to be creative about finding and even not so creative maybe, but we need to be um, committed to doing it. And so I think that's what's interesting about <clears throat> what will happen after the pandemic, this combination of a, a hopefully a, a, a renewed commitment to nature a renewed realization of how, how essential nature is to leading a healthy life, happy health life. At the same time that we've we've done all these slow streets and and um, you know um, pop up um, eating areas and things that maybe will be will be permanent, perhaps. So we have an we're going to have an unusual opportunity, maybe, if there's any silver lining from this time we're in. I don't know if that got at your question or not, but. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I was sure. also thinking about the walkability. I don't know if you hear me. Yes. Um, with the walkability of the city and the effect of having the I feel that we connect. You hear me? Not really. <laughs> I hear you a little bit. Walkability in nature. Can, yes, can you have yes, it? Can exactly. you have sidewalks and natural? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. City I mean, one of the. Is, if the city is uh, uh, like two and not walkable and mostly right. made for cars, right? Um, how much effect have some sidewalk plants? And so do in these cases, do you uh, do we have any direction that we're taking for this kind of specific cases? Yeah, I'm not sure I caught all of that, but um, we feel strongly that you can can and must, you know, part of what our vision of a, of a biophilic city is, is a uh, an outdoor city, a city that uh, propels us outside. I mean, we recognize the reality that 90% or more of our day is inside, right? That's, but we'd like to create a city in which you want to be outside. And, and that means places where you can be, you can walk and, and stroll and, and hike. And in fact, a lot of our cities, uh, our, our exemplary cities are cities that have created um, uh, pathway systems and trail systems, this idea of hiking the city. Uh, San Francisco is a wonderful example of that. Um, actually, Sing Singapore um, has this network of pathways. It's really quite impressive uh, as well, connecting density, points of density with parks and bigger nature. Um, so uh, yes, it's easier if we can, if we can repurpose space from cars, we can even reduce you know, a small percentage of that space. And I don't know what it is in New York, but you know, a typical American city, it could be as high as 40 or 50% of the urban space 
devoted to the car, if you start to repurpose that, um, and as we have seen, we start to emphasize bicycling and, and walking and other modes of, of transport, um, then it opens up huge possibilities. And the nature is really going to be an important design element in making that city more walkable. Um, and we know that, you know, we don't want, we don't want to walk always in the hot sun. Um, we, we need those trees and we need the, the cooling effects of that, of, of those natural uh, elements. And it's self-reinforcing, right? We're, the more biophilic, the more natureful that city, that neighborhood will be, the more we're going to want to be outside and the more walkable uh, it will be. So these are, these are really, um, you know, closely, very importantly, reinforcing um, goals, if you will. Let's see, Earl, you look like you were, you had a hand up maybe. Don't want to put you on the spot, but. No, no, I, I, I joined a little bit late, but I, I was going to ask, you know, solutions for these kinds of things always are dependent on the obstacles. You know? Yeah. So what are the big obstacles that seem to be standing in the way right now? I mean, you mentioned some of them in terms of transportation and uh, right. issues of use in the right of way. Um, uh, me was talking about density. What else have you come across as obstacles to this in terms of mindset or policy or other things? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think there may, maybe the ob obvious ones are um, e economic and, and political. I mean, the economic ones, um, I, I had that one slide about creative ways to fund biophilia. And uh, I frequently get a, a question, some, some version of a question that asks, well, how can we pay for this? Or how can we pay for this? And how do, how do we pay for the maintenance of this? Over It's great, these green and blue design elements, but aren't they more costly? And what, you know, some version of that. And I, I think we have answers to those things. Uh, on, a, on a city scale, it is an obstacle, I think, that we don't fully we're not able to fully calculate what the economic value is of the, of the benefits provided, right? Um, Bill Browning um, has, been, has been working on this. Um, he has this wonderful report, The Economics of Biophilia. Um, it's really remarkable when you start adding it all up. You know, if you, if you green schools, what does that mean in terms of test scores and happier teachers and you know, all these things that in the crime and the gun, you know, all these things I mentioned, have huge potential economic benefits, economic value. If we could figure out how to monetize and how to capture, or at least even estimate those benefits. Um, so that's a, that's a kind of an obstacle. Um, if we start talking about it in terms of, of social equity and racial justice, and when you start pointing out that these, um, you know, that life expectancy is 20 years greater in a in a, in a white affluent neighborhood, you know, that, that does sort of get, begin to get an attention. Uh, so there are arguments that can be made. So there's economic and then political, you know, having the will, having the, the, the leadership, um, ha having groups like, like the one I mentioned in DC that are going to be supportive, um, arguing for working on behalf of this agenda is really helpful. I think sometimes our one obstacle is our lack of imagination. You know, we still, I don't think that we see uh, cities quite in this way. Um, it's one good reason to kind of show pictures, you know, photographs and renderings and to, to you know, we don't see, I think we're still dealing with a kind of mental bifurcation that nature and cities are kind of separate, they're, they're opposites. and. And to, to find the real nature, you know, you have to go out to that national park or you have to go to some far away distant place. Uh, and, and, and we want those, we, we, we want those places and we love those places and we, we want to care about them, but we also want that nature. We want to, we want to uh, begin to cultivate um, this a sense of urbanism that, that understands nature is and wildness can be all around us, like that that James River next to the downtown Richmond. Um, that's that's wild. That's not wilderness, but it's wild and wildness. 
Um, so I think that's part of it. And um, I don't know, I, there are lots of, I'd be curious to know, Lola, you probably have some thoughts about whether we're teaching the right things in, you know, in, in design schools. That's another worry I have, I have an obstacle. Uh, I can't get a lot of uh, architecture colleagues to think about bird friendly design, for example. Mm. I can definitely, yeah, I can definitely, um, you know, when you mentioned that obstacle, I thought immediately, maybe not necessarily strictly, you know, design education, maybe arch architectural engineering or, yeah. you know, yeah. bu building science education that can really provide that correlation and metrics between biophilic design, health, productivity, um, right. Um, right? That eventually affects developers um, yeah. and yeah. have financial impact. So, you know, as to um, how design solutions can uh, provide economic benefit on, on the long run. Right. And uh, uh, there's the bids tool by Carnegie Mellon that takes all these yeah. case studies of biophilic and um, nature driven interventions in buildings and how they can affect, you know, um, in the long run, you know, health insurance right. costs for yeah. workers and uh, um, um, productivity, you know, hourly productivity of, of yeah. workers. And of course, you know, well-being and satisfaction and all these um, uh, yeah. financial correlations can then make um, an impact on decision making uh, yeah. when, when you work with a client. Right. Whether, whether right. It's, a, it's, a, it's a developer or uh, um, client in building or in city so yeah that's that's true good good comment i think it's critical that we make this you know uh relation between um qualitative and quantitative um, right. um correlations yeah good uh, this is this is so exciting to hear about your work, Tim, and your perspective, and it's uh, your deep, profound, and uh, about this this really important topic. And um, it's obvious that you have spent uh, many years, and you know, and you have this experience and understanding. So it's it's really great. Oh, well, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm happy to keep going. Uh, Earl, I don't know if we, I answered your question about obstacles, <laughs> but did, did, was there one that you think of or one that occurs to you as being a... No, I think you hit on the ones I suspected were the big ones, you know, the, the operations and maintenance and expense. Yeah. In terms, in my experience, when I've tried to lean our clients or our municipalities towards uh, softer and greener solutions. Economics is usually the number one. Yeah. Obstacle. Um, but it was great to hear you mention that uh, perception and imagination were also an obstacle. And I think as designers, that's where we have a real shot at tipping the scale a little bit because yeah. we're, we're, we're capable of allowing others or creating, creating the kinds of materials that allow others to see uh, beyond what they know. Sometimes just getting out of the way is, is part of it too. Um, you know, the, the example of that perm, that sidewalk gardening permit in, in San Francisco where the re residents just wanted to plant things. They wanted less pavement and, and yet there wasn't a city permit that, you know, there was a, a kind of a permit that cost a lot. It wasn't really the right thing. It took a long time to get it, you know, um, and, and we see a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, so. I think if we if we um, give folks the ability actually to create green spaces, sometimes that you know that that's a that's overcoming an obstacle, I guess. Hmm. Other other questions. Um, Tim, I really want to be mindful of your of your time. Um, I'm good, we... but I yeah. Do 
I'm hang, I'm willing to hang around forever, but uh, um, well, not quite forever. But. Maybe one more one more okay. question. Ro and Rory, do send me, um, uh, feel free to send me some you know questions by email and and do you know. I frequently say start presentations by saying that you know your 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 task is to uh, find a way to work biophilic cities into a conversation with somebody <laughs> later <laughs> later that evening family member or something, but spread the word and join our network if you feel like it. Um, Rory, did you have um, something to say? Yeah, I, I had a question. Um, I think maybe an obstacle, not so much on the, on the how much does this cost, but thinking about affordability. I think mm -hmm. any, any of us that have looked for apartments in the yeah. city know that the closer you get to water or a park, the pricier right. it's going to be. Yeah. And I'm just wondering how that plays into the conversation. Obviously, yeah. whole cities aren't going to become as biophilic as possible at once. And it, yeah. I can see it happening where the more you increase nature, the more you're driving people that yeah. can't afford it out of that area. Right. Yeah, that, that's a, a, an excellent question and one that we've been thinking a lot about. Um, and, you know, we've we recognize that um, uh, increasing nature, investing in nature, investing in parks, we know there are unintended co consequences. Uh, e Eco-gentrification, as it's sometimes called, um, is fairly remarkable in the, in the sort of span of my, my professional life, how our view of projects like the High Line um, you know, we, we so, so celebratory and so, you know, I still, I still like the High Line a lot, but you know, tempered by the unintended consequences of, of uh, displacement and, and raising the price of housing in that neighborhood display and, 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 and gentrification is often, you know, what happens uh, when, when we uh, invest in, in more nature. So um, I, I, there's no easy answer to that. Um, some people, you know, it's just this idea of just green enough, you know, that you, you don't want too much, you want to green a neighborhood too much that it will gentrify, it will attract people coming in from the outside, but you want it just enough that, you know, uh, residents who live there uh, ha have more nature and have better lives. I have, I have trouble with that. I just, I think that um, we need to, um, this immersive model of nature means that we want nature everywhere. But I do think that we need better tools. Um, we, we need better institutions to uh, help us deal with those unintended consequences. We have some emerging models that are, are, are really promising. Um, I don't know if you are aware of the uh, 11th Street Bridge Park in Washington. That's a, an example that's frequently mentioned. Um, they're, uh, they're actually part of the High Line Network, this network of, of larger urban green projects that are you know, trying to figure out how to, how to address this. And, and there they've done some really creative things um, ahead of even the, the bridge park, the funding for the bridge park isn't even complete, isn't even uh, fully finished. Um, and they're already doing many things in the community. Uh, everything from job training so that uh, uh, you know, local residents benefit from the employment generated by the park. Um, local businesses are, are benefited. Um, um, they have a, they've created a new uh, community land trust actually, um, which will help to secure a certain amount of housing will, will be um, in theory, you know, protected or affordable over, over a longer period of time. They have a buyer's club that they started for local residents, all kinds of things. There's a, there's a, 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 um, um, a kind of uh, equitable development plan. It's actually the, what they call it, that they've prepared very detailed plan, uh, again, ahead of the project, uh, years ahead of the project. Plus the, the, the surrounding neighborhoods are, have been involved in designing the project from the beginning, which is a big part of the, the equity agenda. So I think we need um, to be, you know, developing better tools or applying the tools that we have in better ways and models like the 11th street bridge park i think will be will be really helpful um, but it's it's a, a really important 
um, thing to talk about, think about. Every city just about that we interact with is having this issue, having this problem. Um, Atlanta, for example, has this new um, this new park that's been it's being created out of a, from a former landfill or former open pit landfill that or a, I guess a mine, not a landfill. Um, and and it's going to be a beautiful park, um, already a beautiful park, and they are very much worried about what this is going to do to the to the affordability of the of the older neighborhoods um, around it. Um, so I think again, we just you know we're going to have to. In, in the case of Atlanta, they've basically put a moratorium on new new uh, permits for new construction around. You know, they've, I don't know. It's it's not an easy um, problem to to to, um, to solve. What do you what do you think? I mean, I I have to give a lot of credit, Chelsea. The the sort of the the Highline story is really what got us. You know what really helped us to, to think about this issue in a big way. Um, it, yeah. What are your, yeah, go ahead. I, I don't, I don't know. Those are, those are great examples and I'm happy to hear that it's part of the conversation. Um, so thank yeah. you. It's a big, big part of the, part of the conversation. And I, I, again, I just, as a, as an urban planner, I, I think we, we, um, we, we need to kind of work on our toolkit there and, um, Definitely a good, a good question. Tim, thank you so much. Um, and thank you everyone who, who um, attended the lecture and um, we'll need to continue the conversation. Great, so, yeah. Yeah. Very good. Well, thank you for inviting me and I, I look forward to future interactions and, and uh, if, if you can help us get New York into the network, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, let's work on this. conversations with, with many different people and many different <laughs> colleagues. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So far, <laughs> you know, to, to no avail. But it, it, it's such an important city and so many wonderful, inspirational things right. going on there and so, so much, you know, so much good work and so much, you know, innovative right, right. projects. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Let's 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 talk more about this. Okay. Definitely. Great. Okay. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>